on God, based on the book uh, by Charles Stanley. I think that's a question that maybe we all need to ask ourselves. We're going to really explore this question over the next, uh, throughout this series, uh, over the next few months. Are you waiting on God? Are you waiting on God's direction? Are you waiting on God to call you? Are you waiting on God for an opportunity to minister, to serve, to give your testimony? Are you waiting to accept God or just for that right spot for you to fit in and to serve? The fact is, regardless, we need to make sure when we are waiting on God that we have optimistic patience. It's a word, a uh, phrase, uh, two words that I've used often in my ministry. It's that, that, that point in our lives when we know that we've got to look at the bright side and be patient. That we've got a mission to do, we've got things to accomplish, and that we know that, yes, you can succeed. Optimistic patience is our sermon today in the Waiting on God series. So to start off, we'll say, never say never. That's something else you hear often or have heard before in your life. Never say never. You know, to be honest with you, uh, a few years ago, whenever we first started kind of doing that, the yes, you can't, it was the trumpet sectionals, wasn't the guys? Because the trumpets would say, we can't do that, Mr. Mikey. We can't play that note. We can't practice that hard. And I would say, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And then when we start thinking about that with our faith, and what we could accomplish, so it all kind of started to come together. But what, what, what are the possibilities here for us as Christians, as believers, as a congregation? So we say, never say never. And here's some instances. We're never going to say, I'll never do fill in the blank. And you don't, you don't want to say that because you just never know, right? you got to be on guard against sin. Or maybe if you're going to say, uh, I'll never um, have. I'll never have a new car. I'll never have a new house. I'll never have a wife or a child or whatever the case may be. You don't want to ever say, never say, never. Because you just don't know sometimes. But also, saying never... Give us that bad feeling that we don't want to try. Like we are going to give up. Like we don't deserve something. And we're just going to stop hoping. Stop thinking that we can accomplish things for the Lord. And obviously that's not something we can do. These are all things that are, that are wrong. Maybe you've said, my prayers will never be answered. All wrong. All wrong ways to say never. But here's a, here's a spot, though. Here's another way we can say it that I guarantee you will never happen. God will never let you down. And in that situation, we should say never. Oh, you may think he did. And you may think that he's making you wait for whatever it is that you've been praying for. For whatever it is that you are trying to get to in life. Maybe it's promotion. Maybe it's a family. Maybe it's a ministry opportunity. I promise you, God will never, ever, ever let you down. Romans 8, 24 and 25. We are given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidently. Kind of sounds like optimistic patience a little bit to me. We've got to be patient. We've got to be confident. We've got to not say never except for that God will never let us down. What a responsibility that is for us. That to stay optimistic is hard sometimes. To be patient is real hard sometimes. We want it. We want it now. So let's think back now. To start thinking about waiting on God and what mission or what ministry or what opportunity may lie ahead of you, I think that maybe it's good to think about that day. Maybe we could say, well, think about that day as Christians whenever Christ gave his life for us. And it, it, it makes us prioritize. It makes us remember our purpose. It makes us remember the extraordinary purpose that we have as Christians. Because he died for us. His blood was shed for us. But think back even farther on in, in your life. Remember when you accepted the call? John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Remember when? 
Remember when you accepted Jesus? Do you remember that day when you walked down the aisle? When you repeated the good confession? When you went down to that watery grave in baptism? When you started your path? When you started following that path of righteousness? Do you remember when that happened? You probably had a lot of emotions. Excitement, nervousness, assurance, anticipation. I remember it very well. I was seven, maybe eight years old. We lived in Los Angeles, California. My father was the minister of Northridge Christian Church before the big earthquake out there. And I remember talking to my dad about it at length. And I knew it was the right thing to do. I knew it was time to give my life to the Lord. I knew that I loved Jesus and this was how I was going to accept Him. I knew that my sins needed to be washed away and I knew that I was answering His call. All the excitement but I was nervous too. All the anticipation to know when I was going down that aisle after that church service today. After that sermon, I was going to be the one walking up. Yeah, that was exciting, all right. And then that assurance that comes with it to know that my sins are forgiven, that I'm on that right path, that I need to stay on that path, but that the Lord's going to forgive me because I've accepted Him. Oh, that's a day that we should all remember. And any single time in our lives where we start to feel impatient, any time when we start to feel doubt, I think it's good to look back at that day and remember how you felt. Remember these things and the passion that you had. Now think about that day whenever you were baptized, whenever you accepted the Lord. Think about... After that day was over, all the handshakes, all the hugs, all the people congratulating you. And at that point, how did you envision your life? You probably thought, I know I'm going to go and I'm going to tell all my friends at school. I'm going to tell all my co-workers. I'm going to tell my family. I'm going to really be the best Christian ever. At least you thought you were going to be. The fact is, we, we've all fallen short. We have to continue to try to get back on that path. We have to remember that when we accepted the Lord, we agreed to pick up our cross and follow Him. Luke 9, 23. He said to the crowd, If any of you want to, follow, to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Daily. Or, be an everyday Christian every day. Every day. It's a responsibility that we have. That's the call that we answer so are you ready to serve? You were that day, at least in your mind. And whatever, whatever vision you might have had for the ministry that you were going to accomplish, if you were like me, I thought I was going to go and I was going to convert everybody in Los Angeles, California. And I may even try with some of my friends. But it's not always that quick, is it? We have got to work. We have got to work with purpose. We've got to work with strategy and very directed. That's why we talk so much about our example. That's why we talk so much about our testimony, about our witness. Because those are the kind of things. It's hard to convince someone with words. You have to also show them. You have to show them by your behavior, by your attitude, by your life, and by your faith in our Lord Jesus. So maybe you thought that big opportunity was going to come. And maybe you're waiting on that. It's like waiting in line, though. Sometimes it can be a little impatient. Is anybody here real patient about waiting in line? They didn't teach you that in Boy Scouts? Yeah? It's hard sometimes, no matter who you are. Right? Boy Scout, Girl Scout, Christian, it's hard to wait in line sometimes. Like, I think some of the restaurants that get it right are the ones that you go there and they give you the little pager thing and they say it's going to be a half hour, knowing full well that it should be 15 minutes. Because if you think you're waiting a half hour and you get called in 15 minutes, you're happy, right? Like, all right, we got in early. But the restaurant that tells you it's going to be 15 minutes to keep you there and it actually takes a half hour, before you even go and sit down, that impatience is starting to come. You're tired of waiting. They said it was going to be 15 minutes and it took 20. That's not what they said. This pager should be going off. It should be going off a while ago. That's how we are with God sometimes. We want to follow our own agenda and our own plan instead of waiting on His. 
And impatience with God is not a good thing. It, it can lead to bad things. When he doesn't act as quickly as we want, we can become impatient, doubtful, hopeless, rejected. Now these, don't, don't write these ones down in your little blanks there. Those are still coming. You can write them down, though. These, these are just the way that you're going to feel. When you have to wait. When you start to feel unsure. When you start to just wonder. Just wonder. Here's how you'll feel when you start to get impatient with God. Let's look at some scripture. Psalms 13, 1 through 2. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? This is David talking here. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Ryan. What, what, what is happening here? What, what is he experiencing here? Can you, you, you can hear it. This is written very well. You can hear it in his words when you read them. Fear. Fear. Impatience with God leads to fear. So we don't want to be impatient with God. We want to be very, very patient with him. Do not be afraid. Be strong. Be courageous. He's with you. Also, impatience with God is going to lead to Psalm 69, 3. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking for my God. Frustration. That frustration that we have whenever we are doing our best to set the example, to witness, to encourage someone to come to church, to, to encourage someone to know Jesus. <coughs> It can be frustrating when it doesn't happen as quick as we would like. And finally, Psalm 119.82. My eyes fail looking for your promise. I say, when will you comfort me? Confusion. What am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do next? How has this happened? Confusion can really start to lead us astray when we get impatient with God. So then let's look at what to wait on God really means. There's four things that I want to talk about. Number one, the Lord's not neglecting you, and he's also not forgetting you. He's not. He is there. I promise you, whether you realize it or not, he's there. Maybe, maybe his plan for you isn't exactly what you think it is. Maybe his plan for you isn't that you reach to this person right now or you are given this opportunity at your job or your home or wherever right now. Maybe, maybe he's working with somebody else, softening a heart. Maybe your example, though, is a slow process. Trust him. He's not neglecting you. He's not forgetting you. You must trust him. Ephesians 30. 20, God is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Now think about that for a second. That's why we have a responsibility to trust him. Because he's going to accomplish more through us, through his power at work within us. Infinitely more. Just a little more. Infinitely more. We don't even understand how much more. Your Christianity that you live every single day, it reaches more people than you think. That's why it's so important that we are everyday Christians every day. All the way we're going to follow Jesus. Not just Wednesdays and Sundays. Not just at work. Not just at home. But every aspect of our lives. Because God is working through you. Second. You're not just waiting around doing nothing. <clears throat> to wait on God means that you aren't just waiting around doing nothing. In other words, if you're saying, I know that the Lord has a good opportunity for me out there. A good place for me to really serve his kingdom. Doesn't mean you sit at home and wait. That doesn't mean that you don't continue to live your life as a Christian. That doesn't mean that you don't continue to tell people about the Lord and set the example. You're not going to just wait around and do nothing. There is always opportunity. We must keep seeking. 
we must keep obeying, we must persistently grow. You gotta study, you gotta pray, you gotta be in a church family. You gotta be obedient, you gotta love, you gotta practice those fruit of the Spirit all the way. All the way every day. Don't just sit around and do nothing. This is a quote from uh, JFK, I believe, who he quoted some other guy. Uh, we'll give JFK the credit. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Think about that for a second. Remember the verse in James? If you know the good that you ought to do and you don't do it, then you sin. It fits right along with this quote, doesn't it? They've gone to Scripture for it. We know the good that we're supposed to do. We know that things are changing in our country. Look, we're not going to take up arms, but we have to set the example. If we, as a Christian body, as the kingdom, if we don't set the example with morality, with ethics, and with faith in God, we're going to continue down this path. Number three, to wait on God means you are not missing worthwhile opportunities. Trust Him. Can't force things to happen. You may not see it yet. Because there's opportunities everywhere. Sometimes you gotta wait for them. Sometimes you gotta be patient. Sometimes you might not even realize they're there. Sometimes your faith may put you in a spot where somebody else is going through a crisis and they have seen your faith and seen the example, they may come to you. Again, opportunity may arise. But your opportunities are also there every single day of your life. I couldn't remember what I said. Trust in God's timing and not our own agenda is one of the most important things that Christians learn. Now think about that. Think about it. When we learn to trust God in His timing, when we make ourselves prepared, when we have that witness and we're setting that example, and we trust Him. What an important thing it is for us to learn. That's, I think, when we hit that moment is when we really start to feel that joy. To think, yeah, yeah. We can accomplish great things here. Finally, number four. You're not alone. You're not. Others struggle too. We've all had delays in ministry opportunities, in job opportunities, in life opportunities. But that feeling that we're alone, it brings shame, disappointment, despair, doubt, these are all things, all things, that the devil puts in your head. Look, the devil can't make you do anything. I hope you all realize that. He can't. He can't. But he can tempt you. He can give you He can give you that shame, that despair, that doubt. That's like what 1 Peter 5, 8 says. Sin, like that lion, that roaring lion. It's scary. We've got to remember everybody, everybody faces delays. Everybody has to wait in line. Everybody has to wait for opportunities. Everybody that's a Christian must be patient and wait. And we must be optimistic about it. <coughs> because even when we don't realize it, God's there. Like Isaiah 41.10 says, right? He's always there, upholding us with his righteous right hand. Helping us back up when we fall down, even when we don't realize it, even when we think we're still waiting on God. He's right there with us. So let's look at the reality of these things then. The reality is that we've got to have optimistic patience. We may face those difficult times, we may be unsure. We may want our success in our ministry and our faith right now. We may want our church to be a church of a thousand. We may want everybody in Hartford, even the soreheads, to come to our church right now. Right now. We want our success. We want it now. It's a fast food society, isn't it? 
we must have optimistic patience. Waiting on God is optimistic patience. Dr. Stanley calls it expectant endurance. If you like that one, better write it down. You could also call it confident hope. If you like that one, better write it down. But if it's optimistic patience, expectant endurance, or confident hope, we know that we must exhibit this. So how are we really going to show? How are we going to set the example of optimistic patience? And it goes right along with the four things that we just mentioned. Number one, we are going to be directed. That's right. We are going to have direction in our life. <clears throat> just put them up there, right? Focus on faith in your life and trust God's plan for you. So what is God's plan for you? <clears throat> Live a Christian life. Be obedient. Love. Be a part of a church family. Set the example. Let's keep that direction and focus on our faith in our lives. Second, optimistic patience is exhibited by us being purposeful. We need to find our meaning and preparation. Our purpose is to be prepared in any situation where we might need to give our witness where we might need to give someone a testimony, where we might get the opportunity to tell somebody about the love of Jesus so that we can reach the lost. That's anticipating God's direction. We're ready for it. Let's be purposeful. Third, we're going to be active. No, again, we're not going to just sit around and wait. We are going to be active. Continue obeying. And again, whether you realize it or not, the Lord is working in and through you. You need to be active in your, in your study. You need to be active in your prayer. You need to be active in your church. You guys want to know how to grow stronger in the Lord? Be active in your church. I promise you. These things are easier than you realize. But it's still, it's still a path. And it's still a path we need to stay on. And, and finally, optimistic patience means that we are going to be courageous. Like Joshua 1 9 said, right? Be strong and courageous. God's with us. We gotta face that adversity. We gotta be able to stand firm and bold. Don't tell me that you can't. Because yes, you can. Don't tell me that you're not good about telling people about the Lord. Because yes, you can. How important is it? Is it more important for us to stay in our box and to do things the way that they've always been done? And, to always, and do things that we're only that we're comfortable with? Or is it more important for us to be courageous and to tell people about the Lord? I think we all know the answer to that. Maybe it's easier said than done. But optimistic patience means to have courage with our faith. And that, remember, time is of the essence. Yes, I know that we're talking about patience today. But let's not forget that time is still of the essence because the Lord's promised us our optimistic patience is going to lead to Him one day coming back for us. And folks, that time is drawing near. So what about time since we mentioned it? Time is one of God's most effective tools for teaching us to rely on Him. Think about that. Think about that. How many times have you thought, I need something and I need it right now, and you didn't get it right then? And then after that thing happened, you realize maybe it was better to wait. How many times has God taught you by making you wait? Maybe it was somebody that you were witnessing to. Maybe it was a job or a marriage or an opportunity. Very effective tool that God uses in our lives. Because God likes to teach us. He likes to teach us to rely on Him. Teach us. Just Ordinary people. That's what we are, right? Just ordinary people. Look, or being ordinary takes a lot of work. I can't imagine what being special would be. But who did, who did Jesus tell him, though? He, he's telling everybody. He's talking to all of us. We've all got this responsibility. During his ministry, who is he talking to? Who are his 12? Ordinary people. Ordinary. Fishermen. Tax collectors. <clears throat> what about the people he talked to? What about the feeding of the, of the thousands? 
What about the, the Sermon on the Mount? When people came to hear him, <coughs> ordinary people, and they were amazed. <coughs> they were amazed at his teaching. Ordinary people heard Jesus preach. Ordinary people were amazed by his teaching. Ordinary people were taught by Jesus to stay on that path of righteousness and to be obedient. Psalm 37, 34, last one. <coughs> Put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along that path. Folks, we've got to stay on that path of righteousness. We've got to stay on it, and we've got to be optimistic, and we've got to be patient. He's with us all the way, whether we realize it or not. See, the fact is, those ordinary people that Jesus spoke to, and us ordinary people that he's reached, we have an extraordinary purpose. To serve him, to be obedient to him, and to reach others for him. Oh, we can do it. We can. If we stick together as a congregation, and we, we set the example that we know that we should set, if we take our extraordinary purpose seriously, oh, we can most certainly reach lost people. But what about you? In your life right now, are you waiting on God? Are you waiting on Him to show you what your next opportunity is going to be? Are you waiting on Him to, to really use you? Listen, God wants to use you right now. And maybe right now in your life, you can think of one person, I think we all can, that we know is lost. Look, we're not here to be judgmental. We're not. I've said that from the beginning of my ministry. But we know that you have to have the Lord. And we know that if you don't have the Lord, you are lost. We all know somebody like that. Have you taken advantage of that opportunity? Have you told them about the Lord? Have you told them about your faith? If not, what are you waiting for? Or what about if you haven't accepted the Lord? If you have not come down this aisle and, and heard that call, if you've not repented and be baptized, I'm talking to you. Because if you're saying, I'm waiting on this, I'm waiting on that, I'm waiting to, to get all my sin behind me, I'm waiting to, to get married, and see where my wife wants to go to church, my husband wants to go to church. I'm, I'm waiting until I really, really have, have got my life straightened out. I'm waiting for God to give me that call directly to my heart where I'm just no doubt. I'm waiting for the preacher to be able to really impact me with some words that makes me want to come down that aisle. Listen, here's what i got to say to you. God has already reached out to you. He sent you his son, he offers forgiveness through him, through his blood. God is already asking you. He's already calling you. He's already urging you to accept him. There's nothing to wait for. You're, you're always going to have struggles. There's always going to be temptation. It's going to be extremely impossible for you to be able to really put sin behind you if you don't have Christ in your heart. So what do I got to say? If you haven't accepted the Lord, what are you waiting for? And if you have, we've got work to do. Would you please bow with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for being patient with us. Help us to be optimistic and patient, Lord, with our ministry, with our mission, with our church, with our family, most especially, Lord, with you. Lord, we know that you have a plan, a purpose for each and every one of us. Help us to continue down that path of righteousness, to take advantage of every opportunity that we possibly can. And when the day comes, Lord, when, you've, when we've really come to that spot where we know that you are using us, help us to be prepared, to be bold, to be courageous, and to tell them about you. Lord Jesus, we love you so very much. And we ask, Lord, that if anybody is here today, that is ready to accept you. I ask Lord, that you will give them the courage to come down this aisle and to accept you. I ask you, Lord, that you will help them to wait no more. I ask all these things in the name of Jesus.